Hi Anmol, morning. Good, good Anmol. Good morning, Sunil. How are you? Um, well, are not you? as good today. Things are seems to be a small spike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In Delhi, we've stopped talking about it because it's not well. It's mm. flying through the sky now, you know. So we can only hope that it's hitting its peak and it's beginning to decline. That's all. So this seems to be a. Because, uh, if you look at it today, uh, all over India, about how many? Seventeen thousand cases, eighteen thousand cases. Uh, so it's a it's a bad situation. So it's a bad situation. Uh, I don't know what to say, uh, but you better be careful because I believe you've had cases in Kurg, some yeah. seventeen, eighteen cases. Yeah, the first lot. <laughs> That's, the first that's a lot. The first parcel that's is a lot. <laughs> no, it's. I think. I think uh, people don't realize their own investment in their own health. Yeah, they walk around simple things like wearing masks or keeping a little distance. I think that's all that's going to work. But Very the good true. news is that you have treatment protocols. It's not going to kill so many people. Recovery rates are fifty-seven, fifty-eight percent. Almost sixty percent people are. Official recovery dates are there. I guess. It's a new normal. We have to work with this. This is not going away. So I think for for everyone who's here, we just have to come to terms and start working. Uh, go back to life as it is. Otherwise, uh, with with caution. Yeah, yeah. With 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 whatever precautions you can make, because Sunil, I don't think this will go away for a year or two years. You know, so uh, that sort of crowded OPDs, people climbing onto each other's backs. It's going to be dentistry by demand. You fix an appointment, you go, you get treated, you walk away. I think in some ways we will change for the better. At least private. I think it's going to be new normal, and India is going to learn dentistry from what what's happening in Europe and in the north. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. North America. We have to learn those SOPs basically, and I think, uh, I think and that, also, that's good. That's basically I think also, good. also, Sunil, I think ah. the change was long overdue. You know. I think uh, uh, there Very is. True. Hello, Ralph. You need to you need to un uh, uh, get off the mute. You your microphone is muted, so you'll have to unmute it. Here we go. So Great now, to see you. Great microphone to see you, is on. Good morning and good uh, morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's been a long time. My colleague Sunil is here. Yeah. So we are. Good morning, happy. Ralph. Yeah. yeah we're we're very happy you could join us, and uh, we hope you will be actually able to fly in and see what it's worth. But at the moment, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the yeah. whole world is sort of shut. Uh, how How are things with you in Berlin? Are you Are you in practice? Is everything as usual? Well, um, we still have a, a lockdown at some parts of the university, so which means that uh, only important things are allowed to be done at the university. Okay. Teaching has been done online as we do it right now with this software, so I'm used to that as long as it works. I have not seen my students yet. And uh, however, for practical work, we have changed the security measures. So. We have reduced the number of students by half. We are working in two shifts, and we have um, increased the distances between the people. And that way they can do practical work. We also have a triage system that the patients have, uh, are examined for the special uh, disease. So, so they are, are selected. And that's the way we, we work at the moment. I think pretty much the same what Sunil has been working on in getting the institution completely covid ready. So I think. I think we are yeah. globally, I think it's united us, doing the same things around the globe, you know, trying to cut numbers, work in a more organized manner, reduce the, you know, crowding yeah. of the entities, have a system of patients coming and going. So I guess we have to adapt to it. I think that's the only way forward for us. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in Germany, we have decreased the numbers of the infections tremendously. However, 
in Berlin, the numbers are always three to four times higher than in the average of Germany, which okay. means that either the population density makes it a reason, or maybe even also the sloppiness of some people not wearing masks in the public. Yeah. And this is you really said it. You said mm. it. Two minutes back, I was just telling Sunil that people are not responsible, and then you set into those things yeah. that you can't control. Yeah. It's uh, absolute okay. sloppiness and irresponsibility. Very true. So, right. uh, if everybody is here, uh, so yeah. I'll take the opportunity to introduce Please. our very, very special yeah. guest and a very dear friend, uh, Professor Ralph uh, Johannes Radlatsky. Uh, this is something amazing about Germany, about education abroad, because he's an anatomist, he's an orthodontist, he's into arts, right? So, you can imagine the mental horizons that Audio Professor, Professor Redlansky brings in, right? He, he is the director of the Department of Craniofacial Developmental Biology at the University of Medicine in Berlin. He teaches at the University of San, uh, California, University of Turku in Finland, the University of Basel, and we hope he will be teaching with us at Kurg also. We, we, yeah. we are honored to have him. He did his uh, medicine and dentistry at the universities of Gottingen and Minneapolis. He's received his postgraduate education at the Institute of Anatomy at the University of Gottingen. He's done a residency at the University of Gottingen, and then he's been the professor and director of the Department of Craniofacial Biology at the Center for Dental and Craniofacial Sciences at Berlin. Uh, he's done some great work and uh, uh, so, Ralph, you'd be surprised. People have read your books of yesteryears. This was being discussed yesterday that at Davangiri, where I went and joined after I left the service, one of the most sought after books used to be your book on craniofacial. <laughs> so, we have a lot of people here who are just waiting to hear. And your new book seems absolutely phenomenal, Ralph. So, I think, I think congratulations. And we, we are very happy to, to have you here. And we will host you, and we will wait for an autographed copy of your book, which you will bring for us. So of without course. further ado, I, I will hand over to you also with the thoughts that uh, Professor Radlansky is the president of the Eurasian Association of Orthodontists. They have built such a beautiful uh, network of uh, you know orthodontics without geographical boundaries. When I was I was honored to lecture for them and the first thing they told me was that listen we don't want geographical boundaries it's free please come and join contribute so i think mm -hmm. the eurasian association owes it to ralph and his team for having built it they collect a large number of people in, in Prague every year but you're going to fill in this year so i don't know how it's going to work but uh, he also runs the international symposium which is now a very very prestigious symposium out of Prague every year so without further ado, uh, Professor Redlansky, uh, very happy to have you here, to welcome you to an Indian audience, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank so you, you Anwar, for this, yeah, for this kind introduction. That's very good. And uh, Sunil and uh, Gotham, thank you for inviting me. And uh, Gotham, thank you for helping me with all the technology. You know, this is really has been a little trouble in this morning, but now we are together. That's fine. So the next thing I have to do is I have to activate my presentation. And there are certain buttons that I need to find. Let's say, let's see, there's something that's present now. And then I need to go a window. And then I have to select this window. And then I say share. And now it is your turn. Now you need to tell me, do you see another picture now? No, we don't. Gautam, uh, you need to come on. We need the picture. <laughs> Now it says Meet Google has allowed to see a new window. Yes, Ralph, we see your, uh, we You're see your presentation. This is you, coming. We, okay. It's so, coming. Good. Thank you. And uh, uh, Anmol, you, you said something about me, and I have also prepared some pictures about my biography mm -hmm. and where I work. Do you want to see some pictures about that? Also please, first? please. We, they, it would be very nice. Okay. Because that is... okay. So that's to start with. I, I was born in Paris. And you see me there as a child and with my sandbox friend. This is just a personal picture there just for you. you know, so. And uh, then 
I went to school in northern Germany. That's why I'm also um, able to speak German in a, let's say, a, a, well, flute way. And as you see me here with the guitar, you also can see that I'm always been devoted to music. Um, and then, as you mentioned, I uh, enrolled in dentistry and in medicine in Minneapolis and in Göttingen University. You see times change a bit, like the haircut and everything, but, you know, I'm still the same. Here you see me in uh, surgery in Minneapolis, where I did a lot of surgery. But when I returned from, from uh, Minneapolis, I was not interested in medicine that much anymore. I wanted to do basic research. And that's why I was able to join the Department of Anatomy in Göttingen University in Germany. And there uh, I worked on the development of the face. And I must say this was one of the most impressive uh, times in my life where I was guided by my professor and teacher on prenatal craniofacial morphogenesis. And this, uh, this is a subject that I was pursuing over the last 30, 40 years. And this gave me so much of insight. And that's what I want to share with you. And next to that, uh, the uh, orthodontic professor persuaded me to also do a residency in orthodontics. And I'm grateful for that because now I have these two uh, possibilities that I do basic research and can see patients. And that, I think this is very important to have both. And then when I was um, uh, 33 years of age, I was um, called to Berlin and um, to uh, take over the chair for uh, um, craniofacial developmental biology in the institute that I'm still in. So, so that I can show you some pictures there about uh, the, the dental school. This looks like any other dental school, I guess, you know. So we have um, 600 dental students uh, in our institution. Uh, that's what it looks when the students are not there. Usually you see them all running around, as you know that, like here. And that is uh, my research department. You know, the, the dental clinic is down here where you see all these glass windows where it's very light and bright. And the research department is up here in the third floor of the other building. And uh, there we have a collection of human embryos and we have very many smart people, graduate students, technical assistants, where we uh, pursue our research. And as you mentioned, we published something. So the good thing is, is over here and the bad thing goes to the trash. And we need the space on the floor to really uh, keep the overview of what we are doing. Um, this is a teaching in the good times when we did not have any infection pandemia. So we uh, make use of our garden at the university clinic where we can have seminars out there or where we can sit at the table and uh, have little seminars with smaller groups of students. That's what I prefer to do. And uh, I am an orthodontist also on Wednesdays. So on Wednesdays, I'm in my private practice, which has uh, been yesterday. And as a matter of fact, this is in the center of Berlin at Potsdamer Platz. And uh, it's a very big practice. We are 120 people in the practice. There are, um, as you can see here, this is after the morning meeting. There are 20 doctors and uh, 100 assistants. And they are spreading out now in their... Um, into their treatment cubicles. These are my personal assistants. And uh, what I appreciate is to share the knowledge. And when I don't get any further, I can ask the colleagues how to proceed. So I, we never have to decide things on our own. This is what I really prefer to do. And uh, this is uh, my team of yesterday, uh, where we see patients in orthodontics and craniofacial orthopedics. And as you also mentioned, the uh, Eurasian Association of Orthodontists, I'm grateful of, of being a part of it and uh, being a president. And we, are, can, we, are, we, we can look back uh, for a successful series of Congress over the last 20 years. And the uh, motto that we have is that we want to unite colleagues in all over the world and share the knowledge of the more advanced older people with the younger people. That's what we want to do. And that's why we have these congresses. And of course, we uh, continue with that. And we will have another congress this year in Berlin. It is not in Prague. This is just an exception. Usually, we are always going to Prague. But this time, the committee decided to have a congress in Berlin. And uh, we, will, we will inform you about how we will do it. But you can save the date already, which is November 27th to 28th, which is the first of Advent in uh, Europe. 
Okay, so how what do what do I do when I when I do relax? I mean, there's a lot of work, but there's one thing that I mentioned. One thing is music, and um, I still play the cello. And whenever there's some spare time, I practice, and I'm allowed to be a part of the Berlin Doctors Orchestra and also of the World Doctors Orchestra. So whenever there's the opportunity that the conductors select the people, I'm able to go over uh, and, and, and be part of it. So last time we uh, played Mahler's Eighth Symphony in uh, Paris, where I was born, this was great. And uh, at the pandemia situation at the moment, we cannot do any practicing, but I'm looking so much forward to continue that. That's a re very good thing to do. Yeah, and also, um, as you have seen me with the guitar, I'm also uh, a songwriter. So uh, uh, I'm writing songs of, of how life is treating people. And so so it continued from when, when I was 17 years of age. And this was two years ago when I issued one of my last albums. This is just another way of um, relaxing. Okay, so now uh, we go uh, into professional things now. Um, I want to give you some recommendations of what uh, my lectures are based on. One thing is the series of, um, of, um, of uh, uh, dynamics of orthodontics. This is a series of, of DVD movies that we created some years ago. Um, and we covered things like normal development of the dentition and facial growth and oral facial functions. So this is still relevant, although it's 10 years old now. This is one thing. And the other thing is a, a German textbook, which does not help you much because it is, has not been translated into English, although one of my graduate students is on the edge of doing so, then you maybe will be able to, to read it. But this is a book that I recommend for you. This is Oral Structure and Biology. This is also very recent. I have to get it for you. Sorry. So actually, this is a translation of the, this is the, the German original edition, which is, uh, um, you know, which, which contains everything of oral structure and biology. And uh, it has been translated and been issued last year into English. So this is, this can be read by anybody who is, who's, yeah, I mean, by, by you who is fluent in English. So that's why I did it. And I think this is um, a very good foundation of what we talk about oral structure and biology. And the other book, of course, you mentioned that, that's the Atlas, the face. And I think I will start my uh, presentation um, with um, giving some, show, sharing some, some images of how we prepared the Atlas, how we did that. Um, and then I will talk about prenatal craniofacial morphogenesis, and then I also will address postnatal growth. So this is, I think, um, a good summary of what, what we are doing. So, yeah. Okay, so maybe we start with the making of the atlas. So this is the outline, you know, so um, I think some 10 minutes I can talk about the, uh, the atlas, how, what we, how we did it. And then I will go to prenatal craniofacial development because this is one of my specialities. And then we can also go to postnatal craniofacial growth because we need to know these things when we treat our patients. And uh, as I see it, uh, the postnatal development is always just a continuation of what happens prenatally. I mean, birth is a very dramatic act in everybody's life, but I mean, it's just a continuation of a developing process which has started in the beginning before birth. Okay, so let's go to the, uh, to the uh, making of, uh, of the atlas and let's see if the link works. Yes, here we go. So this atlas has really been a success. It has been translated in so many different languages in the uh, recent times. And it was, um, 10 years ago almost, yeah, not quite 10 years, but it was uh, that the Quintessence Company came to me and asked me, do you want to make an atlas of the face the way you wanted it? And I says, oh, the way I want it is uh, when I studied uh, anatomy as a student, I was always suffering from the fact that there, was, there were good pictures available, but the problem was that when you flip the pages, you lost your orientation because um, when you turn the page, something different was on display, not the one, not the thing that you, ex that you expected. Actually, I, I expected to see something which was underneath and underneath and underneath, layer by layer, but this was not the case. So uh, here is the, uh, the company, uh, the, um, the publisher, this is Dr. Polster, and this is Carl Veska, and this is David Kuhn, one of the graphic people, but this is Carl Veska, the painter, who's the most important uh, 
person in, in this atlas, and he created these beautiful pictures. See that? The layer by layer, you know? That is what we want, you know? And when you flip the pages, you go layer by layer and layer by layer. And uh, we also wanted to um, make an atlas which is not based on uh, cadaver anatomy. We wanted to um, make a vivid atlas of living anatomy. And that is why we asked my daughter, Jana, who is a uh, psychiatrist in the meantime. Um, uh, at that time, she was a student. And uh, we asked her if she could lend her body. And we made a series of 600 MRI images of her, of her head, criss and cross all of these sections. And from that, we, we uh, were able to construct the atlas. Um, so the only thing is from the outside, she looks a bit different than the model in front, because um, there then we changed a model uh, to a photoshopped um, 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 blonde model, which is not my daughter, because we, we didn't want to show her dissected in, in all the sections. So, so it means that also only she and some professionals know that she is the model for the anatomy there. And then we, um, it was difficult then to, to, to create an atlas which goes layer by layer. I mean, uh, you think it is easy just to go layer by layer, but the, anato the, the anatomical structures, they are intertwined in the layers and you follow them into the layers and then how do you want to follow them back when they re-emerge into the layer that you have just left for flipping the page. So it was not that easy to make the construction the way we want. So it took some time to discuss and try it out, what is the best way to arrange the layers in the figure plate. So there's a lot of handwork that has been done. So into these sketches that Calvesca did, we painted by, by pencil and everything, all these uh, structures in there. This was one thing. And then also we sought advice by specialists. So this is, for example, this is uh, Professor Jovanovic. He is one of the best uh, ENT surgeons that I know. Uh, he is very good in doing noses and in laser surgery of the middle ear. This is Dr. Ivanovich. This is Dr. Chakalov. He is a um, maxillofacial surgeon in Hamburg. Uh, I also had the chance to do some surgery together with him on patients. And this is Ulrike Pilzel. She is an anatomist in Austria. Uh, so, so this is very good to have these people together that we um, did not do, a, hopefully, not many mistakes our atlas. And the other thing is we also uh, work together with the radiologists at our university um, to, to share some, who shared some pictures with us with angiograms or other special radiographs that we obtained from patients in order to make sure that we have the real um, arrangement of the vessels also. And then we constructed uh, the sequences uh, and the coordinates, and I also did the description of the plates in both languages that I know, G German and English, at the same time, in order to be able to really have a good flow of the text. And then we sat on the computer, and Karl Veska painted all these pictures always only on Photoshop. This is really interesting that, he, that they are not oil drawings, they are drawings on Photoshop. He developed the technology, make use of Photoshop and paint layer by layer. This is a very important thing since you all know Photoshop and with Photoshop you can, you can put layer on layer. So to start with, he puts maybe the skull first and then on the next layer, he takes the same skull that he painted and then he adds the muscle structures of the first layer. And then he adds the muscle structure of the second layers and you can click away or click add all the structures in the different layers. So you really can compose the situation as it is in anatomy. This is his trick, how he works. And uh, we, we spent three years of uh, creating this atlas, and uh, we are lucky that Karl Veska also lives and works in Berlin. And it was, let's say, half an hour of a meeting, but there were times when we did not meet in person, where we just sat in our rooms. This is my working room in Berlin, and this is his working room in Berlin. And we were, set, were on the phone, and we both had these images on display. And then it was once in a while necessary that we met, maybe every, every other day, and then we worked together in his uh, office. So in here are some, 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 some movies. I hope the movies will show that you can see how he works on the graphic. On the graphic, you only see things on the screen, how he now paints the skull. 
and with the other hand he clicks the sizes and you and the trick is also that you can be very precise in such a way that you enlarge what you do make a very precise painting you know and on the right side you see how he paints the porogarta supercilia muscle in another layer than the skull is so you can really see how he how he merges the layers And now the supertrophia vein is being painted, you know. And that's how it works. So he spent hours and hours and hours in front of his machinery paint. See how it works. And there is an enlargement I took from the screen. Now this is the supertrophia artery that's being painted. He tried. He tried to teach me to do that, but it was so difficult. So, so I admire his art. Okay, let's go on. And now some stills. So they, this is really he's he's uh, educated the classic way as a as an artist. So this, although it is electronic, it looks as if it done as if as if it is done by paste, pencil and paper. Look at that, you know. And now this is a little bit of airbrushing on the computer and. Now the, the cartilage of the nose is first sketched and then it is worked out with all the fat tissue next to it and the teeth. Now this is the mentalis muscle. So first the sketches there, where is it in the MRI images of my daughter and then put the sketches in there and then try out the color and then put the first layer of color like you do an oil painting. See, this is this palette of all these colors and also electronically it is easy to have always the same color. So if you paint with oil, you always have to make a mixture and it depends on your day form and on the daylight if you have the right color together. But if you do it digitally, you have a number set that really indicates the correct color. So this is why all the pictures have the same color code also. This is also a benefit of the electronic way of painting. See, you know, the structure of the muscle is there, the light and the shadow, and it's getting better and better. The fascia, they in white. And then uh, the, he does it with all of the muscles. And then all of a sudden, with a lot of work, the picture is almost complete. That's the way he does it. Okay. And also the, the, the vessels, first they are sketched with thin uh, lines and then they are, have a foundation of dark and then put the lights on and the shadows on. And then they're cut and sectioned. And then it looks, and then put the shadow underneath and you can see how they, jut out and how they protrude and have a real uh, animated view and see these are now many layers put together and then you can see this superposition of the vessels of the muscle of the bone of the connective tissue which holds the eyeball and the oral system and everything see that that's how we do it layer by layer yeah, and then it needs control and check up everything. And then my other daughter, Kalinka, she's also an MD. She uh, was in charge of checking the labeling. And then we know this is 960 anatomical structures. And she took care of labeling of everything and put it into the right order that we don't make any mistake there. So this is our eating table in our living room, which was occupied by the many, many pictures uh, that Carl has painted. And then it uh, was uh, on, on the edge that the book was almost finished. So this is the graphic designer who puts together all the pages and we check everything in the raw prints of the galley proofs. And then there was the day when we issued in, 19, in 2012, when we had the first German edition on the market. So this was really a lot of work to have that done. Yeah, and then I was grateful and proud that it has been distributed all over the world. So this is when I was teaching in Basel in Switzerland. All of a sudden, I did see that the students had this atlas, you know. So this was really good to see that. Okay, so this is just an, um, a little episode of how we did the atlas. And um, I did not want, I did not intend to bother you with gross anatomy of the face. I think this is a pre prerequisite that you all have. I think I want to share... Um, question of how does the face develop prenatally with you? Is that what you what you want to go with me? Yeah. Okay. So then let's start with the prenatal development. Okay. 
morphological and clinical aspects. So it is important to understand that that's, that's what I want to, want to point out, that the development of the face originates from the curvature of the embryo. If the, if the embryo would not curve in that way, we would not have these compression zones, we would not have this bulging here, and we would not have the vistal arches. And if we would not have any of these vistal arches, we would not have the structures like mandible and all the other structures that we will talk about. And later on, we will also talk of, uh, about postnatal growth, of course, and give some clinical hints of the development. So, so these are greetings. These are greetings from there is there's one microphone on which is making noises. I don't know where it's from, or maybe it's from the satellite. This is really a loud noise that is coming through here. So, okay. So, um, um, so there. I don't know where it's from. So I hope to just talk over it. Uh, this is greetings from Germany. These are the chancellors of Germany. And this is interesting to see that all of these human beings, they look like human beings, but they all look the, the different way because then you can distinguish these people from their faces. So they have all individual face, but they have the same facial pattern. So the question is, what is typical for a human face and what is typical for the individual face? That is really an intriguing, interesting question, uh, which I have not solved yet. I only can tell you these are human beings. And by the way, greetings from our chancellor. She knows that she's on the lecture today. So um, this is what we as clinicians want to know. Why is it that the jaw, in some cases, the lower jaw maybe grows too short? And if it is too short, it has deleterious effects on the uh, occlusal system because we know that the teeth are erupting as long as they find some counterpart, and if there is no counterpart because the lower jaw is too short, then the lower teeth will, will um, uh, grow out further and further until maybe they reach the palate, and this is way too deep. So it is, in orthodontics, we always have to, have to think around the corner, which means if we have a sagittal discrepancy, we have a vertical problem as a consequence. We know that, that we think this way. Or here we have another vertical problem. We have a skeletal open bite, which means that the teeth will never ever come together just because of the skeletal configuration. But the question is, how is this controlled? Um, these are um, part, um, two members of our, our an, an extended family. These are Marta and Emilia, and I know them since they were children. And they are uh, monozygotic twins. And the, the question and the problem that I had was when I met one of them single, I wouldn't know if it is Marta or it's Emilia. Uh, when I meet them together, then it is easy because then they look a little bit different. Although they have an identical genetic code, and how can it be that when you have an identical genetic code that you have a different facial ex exterior, so that you have, that you have a different facial um, uh, outlook. This is one uh, important thing. And uh, as you see, when they get older, they look more and more different. And this is an interesting thing to understand. From this, we can derive that although the genetic code is identical, it is not so that the body really follows this genetic code. It is an individual situation that each single cell must not make use of all the genetic information. It is that the cell is selective from the genetic information, and then it depends on how the cells react with their surrounding tissues. And this is why it is very selective, and this is why it can be very individual in individual people, but also within the tissue. And this is one of the clues of understanding that the cells on, only make use of parts of the genetic code in order to develop and to differentiate. That's what I learned from this. So in case, just in case you already have this book, maybe somewhere in your library, the, the, num the page numbers refer to the pages in here. So um, the curvature uh, of the early stage is shown here in the scanning electron microscopical image. And we want to understand how do we come from here where we have this curved embryo with the uh, bulgings of the second and first uh, visceral arches and the maxillary bulge the big heart and the primordium of the arm and the, and the, and the foot. Um, how does it come to the older pieces that we understand better? There are many things that we know from, um, from the molecular signaling. 
you know, from knockout mice that we can isolate certain gene parts that maybe can be rendered inactive. And when we have them inactive, we can elucidate where are the defects in craniofacial development. So for example, if we have a defect in the Barks homeobox, then we have some problems in the posterior part of the dental arch. And if we have some defects in the DLX part of the uh, uh, genetic expression, then we have um, dif difficulties in development in some other regions of the skull. Uh, and this, is, has, this has been elucidated by many, many um, um, studies. However, this is only what we know from our research, what kind of um, molecular signaling do we have? And we elucidate the molecular signaling by in situ hybridization that we need antibody reactions. And if we don't have certain antibodies, we maybe don't know what is going on. And that's why I have this image that I <laughs> here. This is uh, an insight in the car factory at Volkswagen in uh, Dresden where they built the fight on Volkswagen, one of the cars. And uh, I just imagine uh, if I, I don't know how cars are being built. And maybe if I'm from Mars, from somewhere else, and I don't know how the people on Earth are building cars, and I want to hear the signal, and I want to hear what the work uh, then I would say, well, what are they doing? They say, we have to build in the rear seat. Can you give me the wrench and the and then they need the 14P, and then I need another screw, and then they were talking private things like, what do you decide? We have some barbecue over, and my grandma is taking, uh, taking care of the children, so we can have a longer time, and all these things. And then they say, okay, we're done with this car, and take the next car. Then I go back and say, now I know how cars are being built. I just remember the signals I heard. So this is, give me the wrench, put the rear seat, talking about barbecue, and uh, and then next car. So with this information, I and you know that I can. And uh, with the information that we have from the signaling, you know, cannot build a face just by molecular signal. So there is much, much more to it. I, I think uh, you understood why I brought this example car fact. So actually, it is interesting to see how do genes create form and differentiation? That's a lot of things going on. This is just an cytohybridization image here on the left. We don't have to go into details there. I just, this is just to illustrate the situation. I want to go on the right column here. So what do the uh, cells do? The cells grow. They grow just because they want to grow because they are uh, uh, living which means that they grow in size, they get bigger, this is one thing, and they can also uh, divide and they grow by number. So this is what we say is a cell growth. But when they do so, maybe in a Petri dish, they can distribute all over the floor of the dish, but as soon as there are so many cells that they reach the margin of the dish, then they have a space problem they are coming into spatial impediment, and then these cells can no longer spread flat. What they do then is they uh, rise upwards. Maybe they can become narrow, they change their, their cellular form, and then we have reached a form thing. Because now we see that the cells, since they are so and so many cells, have changed their form in order, in order to, to make use of the space. And then when there are so many cells, they are coming into tight neighborhood. And with this tight neighborhood, um, they are exercising forces against each other. One thing is they, they are exercising compression because they are so tight. Whenever you have been in a, a, a traffic jam or in, you know, in a subway or wherever you are, then you can, in a bus which is jam-packed, then you know how the cells feel when they are jammed together. They are exercising forces. Also, there are, there are tight junctions where they have also um, pulling forces, pressure forces and pulling forces. And the cell can well notice what is going on outside at the membrane. They have many, many receptors at the membrane and the cell can, can, um, can find out what is going on out there and the cell can react to this. And the cell has a, a transport and information system in the cell plasma and this goes down all the way to the nucleus where the information is stored in the genetic code, how to react, what is happening outside at the surface of the cell. And then very differentiated, uh, information is read from the genetic code, and this leads to tissue differentiation. So the thing is, 
that uh, a cell which is sitting at that place differentiates in a different way than another cell which is sitting at a different place, and maybe even at different times they can differentiate a different way. So, so this is why you may have cartilage cells here, you can have bone cells there, and you can have maybe muscle cells somewhere else. So this is because we have a differentiated differentiation. So did, I hope you got that. I, I, I mean, I kind of see you now, so I think I, I, I'm, 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 I'm assuming that you're following. And, and now as you look at these pictures taken by Leonard Nielsen, you can see that the embryo first is almost straight, and then it becomes more and more curved. And the question is, why is that? It is because the cells and the posterior part, which is mostly neural cells, giving rise to the, uh, um, to, the, uh, to the spine and to the brain. And these cells grow much, much faster than any other cells. So maybe the other cells didn't notice that the back cells are growing so fast and all of a sudden the embryo curves. And this leads to the bulging here. If you, if you curve your hand, you can also simulate that, what happens. So these cells in front, they have a completely different situation than the cells in the back. And this is even more exaggerated. You see how much the brain leads to curvature of the, of the face, which is now really in opposite of the heart in the fifth week. And then it changes. The question is, what is the reason for this change that once the face has been bulged forwards and has been compressed like this, and then the face bigger and the face uprightness again, as you can see here in the subsequent weeks. So what is the background for that? We want to elucidate. And we also want to ask our, the question, why is our mouth opening horizontally like it is doing in the uh, face of the Chancellor of Germany? and of anybody else. So why is it like this? And it, I mean, this question can be answered easy, easily because in very early times, the face has been compressed forward and the bulges are running horizontally. And one of these two bulges, they are giving rise of the oral cavity. This is why it is opening horizontally. So, and as you can also see here, this is a very, very early face. And if you just take a boxing glove, you can simulate that. Uh, that that oops wait a minute go back uh, you can simulate uh, how it is so so the brain is pushing forward all the other parts of the face and this is why you have these horizontal bulging it is a question of mechanics in this case you know so uh, as you as you look at an early face you can see really the forces that are being exercised so there's one force coming from the brain because that is expanding and then there's another force that's coming from the big heart which is sitting down here and these in between these two expanding tissues brain and heart the facial bulgings are arising and you these are paintings uh, these are drawings from the textbook of Blechschmidt who is another embryologist in the 1950s and 1960s in Germany who explained many of the mechanical aspects of uh, craniofacial development and you can see B is the pressure of the heart and A is the pressure that's been exercised by uh, the brain and then you can see the bulging of the early face. This is just a an up and down like when you look at the uh, geography of the world you can tell all the mountains that are there are just a consequence of geological shifting and if you look at the the topography of the early face, you can derive the forces that have created these, um, this topography. So this is one thing. And the other thing is, how does the oral cavity form? So in the fifth week, we don't have any oral cavity. In the fifth week, where it says ST, you can see this is the pharynx somewhere in the back. And uh, you see the nostrils, they are sticking out very far, so there is no upper lip, there is no cheek, there is no lower lip. At that time, there is nothing. And then it takes only one week that the bulgings protrude forward and forward so that the, the cheek is arising, the lower lip is arising, and the upper part is arising as it comes together here. You see the nostril openings are here now. You see the upper lip with some foldings in there, and you see the lower lip and the black Part. That's the oral nasal cavity. It is very dark in there because there are no electrons going in because this is a scanning electron microscopical image. And you see how the brain is enlarging. And you see now how the brain is pushing forward all the other parts and even the eyes, which are not at all visible in the fifth week. The eyes are visible in the seventh week. Only two weeks later, you can see the eyes are coming forward. You can see that the nostrils are coming forward together. And you see that now the lower and the upper lip 
come together to have a opening of the mouth. And you can also see that the, the uh, bulgings that are there, uh, which are characteristic for the upper lip in the sixth week, they have become smooth now and there's no cleft whatsoever. This is a, a dramatic change of within two weeks, we, are, we have formed an oronasal cavity. This is really impressive to see how that works in the embryo. And by the way, these are uh, images by um, uh, Professor Watt from, from Glasgow. She also shows the, if the, if the movie works, let's see, does it work again? Let's see, come on. Uh, how the proportional changes of the maxillary bulge, for example, how much it comes together. You can really see how it comes together here. That's not human. That is, as far as I remember, that's sheep or something. Okay, so, and I also have to mention that this is not only that we have a change in proportion, we also have a change in size. So if you look at this embryo down here, which is the 12th week, um, and, and the embryo that you have seen on the left side of the previous slide, it has been that small. So if I say that, for example, the nostrils come together, this is not quite true, as a matter of fact. Here, the nostrils are wide apart, that, that's for sure true. And here the nostrils are more together. But in the meantime, the whole face has grown so much that you can put these nostrils in between the other nostrils. So it is not only a question of proportion, it is also a question of growth. This is another important um, aspect. And in the lower big picture, you can see another in interesting thing. You can see the hands. And the hands are sitting on top of the heart. The white thing here, this is just a little part of the of the heart. This is a margin of the big heart and there's no space in the uterus and, and the embryo is crouching together and the hands are on top of the heart and you see and you know where the thumbs are. The thumbs are in the oral cavity and that's what we know in orthodontics. So many children are uh, 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 fond of sucking their thumb which means this is just a, a memory of, of the fetal time when you did not have any oral cavity and then you have your hands sitting on top of your big heart and the thumbs, they are sticking in the face, inside of the face and the oral cavity grows around the thumb. So it is a very normal initial combination between thumb, uh, oral cavity and the feeling of it. So this, this is why embryologically we can explain why people like to suck their thumbs when they are just newborn. Okay, now we uh, have to go into, let's say, more theoretical de details. Um, we all know that, that we have these visceral arches, and they are numbered in all the textbooks. And uh, so from the first visceral arch, we know that the mandible, Meckel's cartilage, and the malleus and the incus derive. This is one important thing. And when we have, a, let's say, a temporal mandibular joint issue, maybe a pathology, uh, we have to elucidate if there is a hearing problem, yes or no. And if it's in this patient there is a hearing problem at the same time, and we maybe have a T and J malformation, then we know this is a first arch, maybe even a syndrome. And if the patient is able to hear the proper way, but there are still some changes in the temporal mandibular joint, then we can uh, differentiate that this is a, um, a single pathology and not a syndromatic pathology. So this is an important knowledge that we have since we know that everything is derived from these visceral arches. And then of course, textbook knowledge is that all the other visceral arches give rise to certain structures. I don't have to go into detail here. You can really read that in the textbook. But I want to emphasize one mechanical aspect of development. Uh, I told you uh, that it is important that the embryo is curving and uh, folding forward together. And as a consequence, the visceral arches form. And what happens within each single visceral arch? What happens in this bulge? And again, I want to remind you when you are uh, having, uh, when you have to have a ride in an overcrowded bus, as we have that in Berlin all the time. And I guess it is not different in your country. So the question is, where do you want to be? Want to be? Do you want to be close to the window? Do you want to be close to the door in order to be able to hop off immediately as soon as possible? Or want, do you want to be wedged inside the center and there's no way for you to get out when the bus stop is arriving? So this is really my problem when I'm in the bus. Um, so um, the cells in the visceral arch in the center, 
they have a different surrounding, surrounding situation than the cells at the margin. The cells at the margin, they have good access to nutrition, they have good access to getting rid of their metabolic wastes, but the cells in the center of the vistal arch, they have to endure all the neighbors, they have to endure all the cells, what they are giving as a as waste to them, they are exercising pressure to the center cells, and then these cells, all lined up in the center of this vistal arch have to make a important decision. You know, I like to anthropomorphize, you know, I, the cells have information in their nucleus and they know what they can do. And so in the nucleus, there's written something which says like, you have to activate SOX, SOX9, which means that's uh, the signal for creating cartilage. And then these cells know how to create cartilage, how to, uh, or to produce chondroitin sulfate, and then this, then they do this, and then different, they differentiate into cartilaginous cells in the center of the first vistal arch. And why is it uh, uh, is it such a longish, like a Meckel's cartilage, uh, a longish uh, part of Meckel's cartilage? It is because the center of the vistal arch is longish, and then you have in the center these cells which differentiate into cartilage, and this is called the Meckel's cartilage. You can see it down here in the early stage. And, and then there are many other re regions where we also have uh, cartilaginous formations, like in the nasal capsule or in the second vistal arch or in the cervical spinal column or at the skull base, wherever you are. So whenever, in other words, whenever you have compression, the cells can react by forming cartilage. This is an important knowledge that we can derive from embryology. So this is the first step. So we have compression exercised by the brain, exercised by all over the curvature of the embryo by mechanical uh, exercise. And then we have something that happens inside, Meckel's, uh, inside the cartilage. Now, the cartilage itself is, as you know, very active because cartilage can grow. And, when, and then they, they have os osmotic phenomena and also they get bigger and bigger. And the question in which direction does cartilage grow? Well, in the Meckel's cartilage, it grows in the length. And as it is triangular in form, it can also, of course, grow in transversal direction. So this is why the mandible gets bigger, longer and wider. And that's what happen what's happening here. And then the nasal capsule, we have a 3D arrangement of the, of the uh, cartilaginous cells and when they get bigger, when they swell, when this tissue grows, then you have a vertical um, expansion of the face in the maxillary region. You have a transversal expansion. You can see that in this picture. And you have a sagittal expansion. In other words, once the, the, the face has been compressed and this compression gave rise in, of cartilage in certain regions of the face, the cartilage itself reacts so that the cartilage gets bigger and then it counteracts this being compressed. And this is now that the oral cavity gets much bigger and the face uprightens. So there's a lot of mechanics, there's a lot of movement during yeah. development. This is what I wanted to highlight with this sketch. I hope you, you could follow my, my uh, explanations here. Now th I think this is a very important um, phase in, in, in facial development. And uh, now let's uh, have a look into our research. You can see now here, this is one of our fetus, fetus, fetuses that we reconstruct in 3D with the technology that we obtain. What we do is we make serial sections, and from these serial sections, we trace the contours of each tissue, and we label the tissue with color. As you can see here, this is brown is bone. We have the temporal bone. We have the... Uh, zygomatic arch, maxillary bone, and we have the mandibular bone, and then we have muscles in red. This is temporalis, this is masseta. We have the gland, the uh, parotid gland. We have cartilage in blue, which is the nasal capsule, or is Meckel's cartilage in the back. So all of these tissues can be recognized easily. And how do we do this? You see, I've been doing that for a long time. So, so this is, I, I'm sitting here in 1993. Three, and this is more recently, you see I have also some remodeling in the back, and these are thousands, thousands of serial sections. So if you section an embryo, you have 2,000 or even 3,000 sections on glass, and you have to look at them. This is one thing. And uh, we have a collection of human embryos, which now uh, has reached the number of 50,000 sections. 
uh, as I counted them. And at the moment, they are being scanned in, and digitized in order to make them available for any scientific public in the world. So they will be on the internet soon. You can find the page down here where you can obtain uh, the access to the, to the sections. And here you see uh, we have a semi-automatic microscope. So this is a slide scanner that can automatically scan, well, you have to put in the slides, which can automatically scan an autofocus uh, pictures. And then it puts together on the level of, of cellular resolution. So you can have an overview because it puts together all the images. And then you can have an overview at the same time as you can also focus on a single cell. You will see in a minute that um, Dr. Renz, who's a co-worker of mine, uh, can focus now into the uh, nasal septum. This is a murine embryo, and you can see the, uh, the cartilaginous cells of the septum. So you can really have both, the overview and the detail. And when we do that with every single section, uh, we can trace the contours that you want to see. This is, for example, a, a mandible with the dental primordia and the surrounding bone. And, and, and if we were to trace all these, these structures and put them together layer by layer again, then we can uh, come to a point that we have a 3D reconstruction, in this case of the mandible, where we can render the colors properly. And then you see this is bone, this is uh, the alveolar inferior nerve, the lingual nerve, and this is Meckel's cartilage. So if we do that with everything, with every embryo, we, we can images get, get images like that. We can also print them out in um, uh, stereoscopical images, and we discuss them with our smart graduate students, and we obtain knowledge and insight of craniofacial development. And here you see an example of, let's say, a fetus, uh, an embryo, which is a 22 millimeters strong rump, very small. Uh, we have a possibility of making an electronic dissection. You see the outer skin, the eye, the nose, the lip, and you can see the um, trigeminal nerve, and you see the middle ear and Meckel's cartilage. And then we can make the skin transparent. You can also see the maxilla, the oral cavity, the mandible, the eye. And then you can take the skin away. And then you can also rotate it around 36, uh, 360 degrees in order to have uh, an impression of how all these structures are related to each other. So this is how we obtain knowledge um, of the embryonic development that we have. Yeah, and with this, what happens? And, and with this, uh, we can also um, do micro CT imaging. For these embryos which have not been sectioned, we can do that in such a way that we uh, have a are having a cooperation with the um, Institute of Mathematics at the Technical University. And then we can scan these embryos and we can have a look inside and also have to trace the real contours. We have to find out what is bone. And when we do that, then we uh, can also inject um, um, the tungsten carbon uh, acid in order to make the vessels visible. And the uh, processing time, though, um, is three and a half hour of radiation of this. I mean, this is a specimen. Uh, and then there's another, let's say, half a day or even a day, it depends on how complicated the structure is, of rendering and computing time in order to come from here to there. And then we have a very good access of, into prenatal craniofacial development. I think with this, I could have given you um, an insight of uh, how we do our work in prenatal craniofacial development and this is the point where we can stop here and where we can go into postnatal development in order to finish up the lecture. Um, is that okay with you? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, so then maybe after that we can go also and ask some questions, you know. So, so let's go to postnatal growth, which is of course clinically more uh, important. Um, so let's check that. Uh, there is the um, important thing that we as orthodontists know that we have a change in proportion, of course, and then we want to we want to elucidate the regions of where does growth really happen. And of course, this has clinical implications. As I showed you, a short mandible has a vertical problem in the occlusal arrangement of the teeth. So when I look at these skulls, um, I see changes in um, proportions. 
But what I see is that the orbit is always of the same size. So we need to see where is my difference when I see the changes of the facial growth. And for example, these are my two um, granddaughters. This is Wanda and this is Elin. Wanda is half a year old, a little bit older than half a year now. And this is Elin, she's just turned four. And you see the changes in proportion of her faces. And I have these lines in there. You can see the eyebrow, maybe is our reference. But then if you go to the lower part of the nose in Wanda, you can see that Elin has even obtained more of a vertical growth of her mid face. And if you go to the chin of Wanda, you can also see that also there in the lower part, the face of Elin has grown much, much more within these three and a half years differences between these two individuals. So it's always interesting to see in your own rel relatives that you have how, how the changes uh, occur. And also when you go on Instagram, you can see like, like for example, uh, Harry Potter's um, uh, actors, Emma Thompson, that's not that obvious, but in Daniel Radcliffe, it is much more um, uh, obvious how a roundish face turned into a vertical face during postnatal growth. And we can also see that in our professional uh, in assessments of when we look at the faces of our patients and do all the measurements, you can see that with 11 years, the face is still roundish, but then with 18 years, it has become a real vertical face. The question is, where uh, is the reason? Why, why does it happen that way? And again, it is important and interesting to go back into prenatal time. So this is why we look into a fifth month of prenatal development and you see that the orbit has this size and underneath this orbit you see space for only one further orbit. If you look at yourself or if you look at me you can see there's one orbit, two, three, maybe it is two or three or even four orbits depends on how vertical the, this, uh, the space is constructed that you see there's more orbits than only one. So this is where you see where the changes are from. Uh, you see also the, the sutures are wide open, which is normal for that time of development. Um, now, if we go a little bit further, you see that um, we are close to birth. I have this thing in, in I don't know where, where I can go. I could push that away. Okay, so now we have uh, the six month uh, around birth. So it could be it is directly birth or six months after birth. You see that the orbit is there and underneath of the orbit, there is again only space for one orbit size. And this is why maybe the cheeks of the babies are so protruding so much. There is not much space for the fat to distribute. This only comes later when the face grows further. And you see the fontanelle wide open and the sutures have approached, but they never close. So, so this is the situation that at that time. And then uh, in the, look, if you look at the same uh, specimen from the front, you can see how small the maxilla is in, rel in relation to the infraorbital foramen, how um, the dental primordia are protruding are about to emerge. They have to emerge through the gingiva. And then you see then they're coming out at six months after birth. So this is just the timing. And you see there's not much of a vertical development at that time. Then when we go to six years, you can tell from the dentition that we are close to the emergence of the first molars and the lower incisors, which are permanent teeth. So then we are in the six, just about six years. You see that the uh, vertical uh, dimension of the lower face has increased a lot. You can see that the orbit is only seen as a marginal structure here. So now we have a proportional change, which is in, tremendous. And I also want to outline what happens in the horizontal or what happens in the maxillary arch. Um, if you look at this arch, you can see that um, the first molar is emerging here. And you see that the second molar is preparing itself for emerging only six years later. Um, so you can tell that te teeth are able to create their own bone. This is an in interesting thing that the, the tooth bone interface um, it has the ability to tell the surrounding bone you need to grow bone. So teeth know how to do that. That's, that's important to know. That's one thing. And the other thing which is important here is that, that we see the suture between the maxillary bone and the uh, palatal bone. The suture is uh, just between the two teeth. This is important to see that. We have to compare that with the older stage that we are just approaching in a minute. Okay, so we have understood that. So now let's go to the adult, 17 years. 
uh, we see that the orbit is no longer visible at all. We see a permanent dentition. We see the second molar has emerged, and we see that the uh, third molar is coming. So now we have an adult dentition. If you look at that maxillary region, then you can see that the second and, uh, molar has emerged the same way as the first molar has emerged, and that now the third molar, the wisdom tooth, is doing the same thing that the second molar has done just some years ago, um, that it is creating its own bone when it is preparing itself to, to emerge into the uh, dental arch. This is one ability, so there's dynamics in there. And the other thing is, uh, remember, that I indicated that the suture between the maxillary bone and the palatal bone was running across at the height of the first molars. Now, in this specimen, we see that the suture is running between the second molars. So there are two conclusions that we can do. We can either say, well, there's a lot of dynamics. The teeth are moving and changing their, you know, uh, their relationship to their bony supporting structure. This is one conclusion. And the other, maybe more scientific conclusion is, well, we have seen only two specimens. Uh, we have to elucidate further what is the rule. Uh, so where is the suture normally located and situated? Is it is it uh, in the first molars first and then it moves to the second? Or is it so that there's a certain variety? And this brings me to the point, I have another skull here, I can just can check that. So this is a skull which I can check where the suture is. And in this case, the suture is, uh, well, it is located between the two teeth. I don't know if you can see, you see it here. So it is a little bit like that. So this is, again, an adult skull. So then we need to elucidate more uh, skulls in the age of six years. But the question is how much there are available. So this could be another research um, topic for people who want to do research in this field. So, you know, whenever you give lectures, you always ask questions. That, that's what my fate. So I only can tell you what I know. What I don't know, I also point out. So. Okay, so now, uh, when, we, when we have the uh, proportional changes, when we line up the uh, skulls in this way, you can see that now the uh, vertical dimension of the face is very much dependent on the development of the dentition. This is a very important thing, and we can take the, um, the orbits as landmarks because they obtain always the same size. This is why we also see that children always seem to have so big eyes, but it's not the case. It's only because the eyes do not grow any further, and it's a proportional question. And the proportions uh, have been highlighted in one of our uh, dynamics of orthodontics videos that there are some spill pictures on that. So you cannot see that easily when you have a completed skull, but when you stain the neurocranium in orange and leave the other parts of the bone unstained, then you can better understand the dimensional changes that are taking part during postnatal development, which is really impressive to see that. And the question is, how does a skull grow? That's not that easy. It's not as easy as it is when you see, let's say, um, a, a tree growing, which is this concentric circle. So, it, so if you can make a little experiment when you have a piece of paper. You can just take a little um, uh, a mandible. I can just do it maybe quickly. If I have a pencil, I just take it and do it for you quickly. So this is the mandible that I have. And if I just go with the concentric circle just around the mandible, and just in case you have a pen and a paper, you can do it yourself also. But then when you do that, circle by circle, all of a sudden you see that the form of this mandible is lost. So that's not the way it works, you know? That, so the growth is not that way that you have a concentric growth around, um, like in the tree. It is because we have we need to have differential growth in different directions, but the question is how is that done? Um, there are some problems in the uh, subcranial skeletal skeleton where we have problems where we don't have uh, proportional changes in growth in a po possible way. This is really like here, uh, where the uh, femur and the humerus really don't grow. So this is the osteogenesis imperfecta. This is just a side effect that I want to mention, but I don't have to follow that into details further. Um, here we want to see work from Donald Enloe, where he started in the 1960s of the last century to superimpose children's and uh, adult mandibles. 
uh, if you look from the top, you can see that the condyle of the children's uh, mandible does not fit the adult mandible. If you look from the side, it's even more obvious what is going on. You see that um, you have, of course, you have growth of the of the condyla region, of the posterior region of the uh, ascending ramus, but, and this is important, at the same time, you have to have a reduction of bone in front. This was what Enlo described in the 1960s of the last century for the first time. And uh, he elucidated it much, much further in such a way that um, he now comes to the 3D arrangement of this apposition and resorption. So if you look at the mandible, this becomes maybe a bit more obvious um, in 3D. So we have growth of the temporomandibular joint region. This is important. Uh, this is what everybody knows. And we also have a growth in the back of the mandible. And we have also growth at the lateral aspect of the mandible. But when we have growth at the lateral aspect of the ascending ramus, we must have at the same time resorption in the inner part, and we must, must have at the same time resorption of the anterior part. Otherwise, you get this bulky, clumsy form that I have just uh, sketched here for you. But if you have this well-defined um, appositional growth and at the same time resorption, then you can maintain the form of the mandible. And this is what Enlo described, not as growth, he described it as remodeling processes. And this remodeling, that's the new term that he introduced some, uh, I don't know, it's a 50, 60 years ago now. Um, this is important. And this is a, a principle that explains us how the face grows. So the same is true when, the, when you see like, the opening of the nose where you have expansion because the face gets bigger, you must have apposition towards the eyes. Otherwise, you get a hole in there. And, and as a matter of fact, the bone between uh, the eyes and the nose is very thin there. So, so this principle of remodeling, that's, a, that's an important thing that we have in orthodontics. This is one thing. And the other thing which is important and complicated is, why do all these faces look so much different? Um, this is a scheme from Van der Linden that he created also 30 years ago. Um, and I take one example. I take the uh, sphenol uh, occipital suture here. And uh, this is located somewhere in the, in the lower part of the skull base down here. By the way, Bjorn Melsen did a lot of um, research on this sphenol occipital suture. In this uh, case, it is only important to know that this, that this uh, suture is located in an oblique angle in the skull base somewhere. And then if we, protrude, if we, if we project that into uh, the vertical and into the sagittal aspect, you can tell that depending on the angulation, the aspect of the vertical and the sagittal are depending on the ang angulation. And the cells which are sitting inside of the suture don't know anything about that. They only create growth, sutural growth, and then they just increase the size of this region but the, increase, the, the size increase is dependent and has its, its effect on the angulation of the suture. And, and this is why uh, we have so many different proportions of the face. This is why we have so many different um, pro, um, yeah, proportions. We can, we can distinguish these faces. We have higher faces, we have broader faces, uh, we have different facial types. And this is, um, depending on how the orientation of these sutures are in the skull. And this is not the only suture. There are many, many other sutures in the skull which contribute this, to this effect. And now if you imagine that this change is maybe distributed in a different way on this face, and also timing is different, and also right and left is different. That's what we also know. This is just a two-dimensional sketch, but you must imagine this is a three-dimensional face, and there uh, you have differences in the right and in the left side also. And this will also um, lead to the point that the occlusion, the interdigitation of the teeth in this adolescent face cannot be proper during the whole time. So this is why we have also some occlusal adjustments necessary, and this is even the case why we have some temporomandibular issues in adolescents which are only temporary. It may be that these issues are relieved just by further growth, and then it adjusts the occlusion better. So we also have to have an eye on this interesting phenomenon. So postnatal craniofacial growth, together with occlusion and orthodontics, it is a very important and interesting 
complicated subject which is worthwhile being studied. And then we have these Bolton standards, of course, and they show how the phase growth into, let's say, uh, into the oblique chin-wise direction. There can be some adjustments in different facial types. Um, uh, we know this from the textbooks. And uh, the important thing is what we found out now is that the dentition plays an important role. And I can sketch this also by just adding more and more teeth to that. See, here we go. Okay, and then, uh, of course, we have different um, facial morphologies and we have different facial ge geometries and we have fa different mandibular ge geometries. We have almost a rectangular angle here or maybe have more an oblique angle here. And if you put that into a whole face, you can see um, this is um, taken from Björk's skull collection. You can see that we have a skeletal open bite here. Uh, where, where, where the teeth don't even come together in front. And here, here we have a skeletally uh, caused deep bite here. And you can see the different configuration. You can see uh, the rectangular outline of this mandible, and you can see the wide open, we call this gonial angle, which is open here. This is one aspect. And the other aspect is, if you look at this, these two skulls, more into the focus of muscles, you can see that the fossa of the temporalis muscle is much deeper in this patient, uh, patient in this skull. And if the fossa here of the temporalis muscle is very flat. So from this, we can conclude that here, the temporalis muscle is very thin and small, and here the temporalis muscle is very fleshy and big. Same is true for the masoteric muscle. And, and so you can derive an interdependency between the muscles, which are strong on the right side, and then they really clench together the jaws, and this leads to the deep bite here. And here you have these soft muscles, not very much force in there, and maybe the tongue is even stronger than the perioral muscles, and this leads to this, let's say, more uh, less forceful face. Yeah, that looks much more weak. And these are the two... Um, extremes that we have in orthodontic patients. So for functional therapy, when we want to um, change the, 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 the functionality of the perioral muscles, we have to also talk to the patient and say, you need to do more of your exercises. You become more aware that you have these muscles. Maybe you need maybe logopedic or myofunctional therapy in order to, to form your bone better. And this guy, he needs to be told, you should not clench together all the way. Maybe you should relax a bit better. I mean, it says, it's easily said. The question is, how can you really put that into your treatment? But this is just a hint of how I deal with these different configurations of faces. Okay, we know, also know that puberty is playing an important role. I remember, this is why I showed you my sandbox friend Elke in the first introductory picture that I had. Uh, we were, were together all our time when we were children. We lived in the same house and we were all together, but there was one problem. When she turned into puberty, when she came into puberty by the age of 10, I as a boy did not. And this is why she changed a bit earlier than boys do and this is a time where we lost track and everybody who has been in the same situation boy or girl knows what i'm talking about and uh, and this is also important for us now to know that girls are a bit ahead in their craniofacial development not only craniofacial the whole development but also craniofacial development and this is why we need to see our patients at 10 years at the latest in order to check if there maybe is a growth adjustment necessary yes or no by means of orthodontics and then the boys come a bit later but then afterwards at, at 18 years then maybe we have met each other better again today when we're in our 60s we are in very um, very frequent whatsapp conversation again so times have brought us back together so this is important what puberty does with us and uh, there were times when people applied a lot of uh, head uh, hand wrist x-ray in order to elucidate the uh, developmental stage of facial growth. We don't have to do that anymore since we have the lateral head film. And from the lateral head film, we can take from the um, uh, cervical spinal column, we can see the maturation stages. This has been introduced by Franke and Pacetti oh, 20 years ago almost. So then we do that practically. 
And uh, I mentioned the muscles, and I think this is an important thing, that we have to take care that the muscle function is regular and normal. If this is not the case, if, for example, here we simulated a mouth breathing habit, if this is not the case, you can see that the, um, the tongue is lower because the patient has to breathe through the mouth when the no nasal airway is obstructed, and then, uh, which means that the lower part of the jaw is expanded and the upper, part, upper jaw is compressed because the vaccinator muscle, this is deleterious and creates an open bite. So we also must take care that the um, soft tissue works properly. And now we see a... comes and then we approach the adult phase when this patient is uh, 19 years of age, the orbit still is the same size, but it's called increase. So this is really a change of proportion. And then we say this individual is grown, is adult, but we need to make sure what that what it means. It means that, of course, uh, we have these uh, malformations, we have the problems when maybe the mandible did not grow properly, then we have these occlusal problems. We can have uh, lip problems that maybe the lower lip is pushing too far against the upper teeth and this prevents the lower jaw, see that, from growing. In this case, you see the, the jaw itself, the mandible wanted to grow, but the alveolar process was not allowed to grow just because the lip is pushing against the teeth. So this is a typical class two, division two malocclusion that we have. So the, the soft tissue can really um, influence the facial growth. And here, it is the too big uh, tongue, it is the mandibular protrusion, and it is a airway obstruction, which does not let the maxilla arch, maxillary arch grow. And here we have this vertical issue where we have way too much vertical ge geometry and the dental arches don't fit together. And this is uh, what we have then in the, why we do the, uh, the analysis in uh, Lateral head films in order to obtain our angulations and our predictions of growth. This is how it works, and we can put that together on the face, and we can see how the face can be changed. So, so the take-home message is then that we have changes in proportions, we have complex sutural growth, we have continuous bone remodeling, the dentition is very important, and we have the importance of facial types. And then we have our deleterious growth if we have deficiencies of growth. So this is, I think, very important. And with this, I think I have covered aspects of uh, prenatal development, of <coughs> postnatal development, and of how we make the atlas. And I think I finished sort of in time that we can say uh, thank you for your kind attention. I mean, it was uh, 90 minutes of a, uh, a, a, a strong ride through all these different parts of uh, craniofacial development. Uh, and I thank you for your kind attention. And I think I would like to see you back. So I wonder how that works. So if I go back here, and if I want to go back to, oh, where do I go? Uh, to here, then you can, uh, I can see you all back again. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So then, no, oh, wait a minute, presentation for this? No, 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 I say uh, presentation. You stop the presentation, uh, Ralph. Here we are. Now, is it okay? Can you see me now back again? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, yes. yes, we can. So, very, yeah, okay. very, very fascinating, uh, Ralph. Absolutely amazing, the volume of work. It seems to be a life's passion, the amount of work you put in in this field. And, mm -hmm. and, and for so many years of having taught it and learned it, I, I wasn't very clear about so many concepts that you've cleared today. I'm sure mm -hmm. everybody here is going to share my uh, thoughts on this. So we're really, really grateful. I mean, that's a that's a difficult topic. It's it's complex, but you you've summarized it and put it together so beautifully. Mm. Most most grateful for your inputs. So, are there any questions? Are there any questions? 
I can see Dr. Shashidhar. He he mentioned reading your book years back when he was a postgraduate. I mean, here he is. So I'm sure he'll have a few questions for you. Let's start with him, Shashi. I'm sure you have some questions. Sir, I essentially have something with uh, relation to uh, midfacial growth that he was talking about. Uh, at what time, uh, in your experience, do you find the maximum amount of uh, the midfacial growth? that would occur because in forensics we were working on uh, different angles which could predict the age so uh, in your experience which is the best i mean where does the maximum growth occur dr Rash? well well I, I think what i mentioned is during puberty and the question is uh, that when this patient comes into puberty and uh, it's an individual uh, phase so it i would expect it between 10 and 12 uh, 13 years, although we know that there are some early developers and there are some late developers. So it is individual, but I would expect this between this time span between 10 and 12 something. Okay, uh, joining on to that, uh, at least in the Indian population uh, over the past maybe five to seven years, uh, we find them hitting puberty a little bit earlier than what it used to be, let's say around 15, 20 years ago. Uh, is it the same experience towards your, your, your side also? Well, this is what we, do we call this a secular trend or that we see that the children come into uh, maturity earlier than they used to cent maybe even centuries ago? I don't know. So, yeah, this, this could be, yeah. Um, that, that's what we see in our practice when we see the patients. You know, you have these children and then you postpone the initial treatment because you say we want to be more effective when you start growing. And then they come every, let's say, every six months to check that and all of a sudden they are really uh, exploding in growth. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, and a pleasure, pleasure listening to you. Uh, yeah. I think, I think we're going to we're going to look at sort of collaborating with you on some research. Uh, uh, Professor Shashidhar really uh, put up a department of forensics here. So I think I think we're going to look at you for a lot more help after this. So you're not done with us. Let me put it like this. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to doing that. That's good. And, That's great. Yeah. And we, have, we only hope that, you know, everything is good and you are with us in February and so are a lot of your colleagues from Europe because we can promise you that it will be a great place to visit. And you don't need to carry a guitar because and don't, Sunil, you have guitars Sunil available. Two of them, and it's okay, usually good. a good thing to pick up the guitar after dinner in his house. So oh, I'll then we do some singing. That's that's good. Why not? That's <laughs> good. So so you are so you are in in, in good in good uh, hope uh, that you will have no problems with the pandemia at that I, time. In I have no. I mean, I have uh, Professor Shashidhar and me. Every day we compare notes. When is it going to spike? When is it going to ease off? <laughs> I, I, I just, I just lost count. I'm just waiting and hoping that life would go back to normal. And and just the thought of being uh, back in, in in Europe, in in Berlin, which is one of the most yeah. beautiful cities that I love, uh, <laughs> drinking some beer and uh, eating some worst. It's it's it's, mm. it's something which looks like a dream now. It, it's, 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 you know, yeah. it seems like you went to sleep in March in a different world and you've woken up in a different world. You know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. changed so much. But uh, yeah, we, I'm, I'm... we are hopeful. Uh, we will yeah, have you here good. next year, no matter what it takes, uh, Ralph. Yeah, okay. So, so we, we are looking forward to that. Yeah, that will be So maybe your place is the paradise which has not been. Uh, Absolutely. found by the virus and then that's no, 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 good no, no, then no. It's, 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 it's strangely the virus is finding its way they had only one <laughs> case in the last three months and yesterday they had 18 hello <laughs> that, that's good well and i have been tested negatively you know i can promise that you know <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. so yeah. so on behalf of uh, everybody here on the students the faculty staff and and all our colleagues from around the world, I saw Dr. Somtai also mm -hmm. here. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Rob. That is very, very fascinating. I mean, it's a field mm -hmm. where, you know, you've done so much of work and there's a lot of, I can see a lot of art and creativity that comes in. I'm not surprised. You play the cello, you play the guitar, you write songs. I think it's a big yeah. lesson here in India that, you, you know, your profession is one part of your life. There's a lot more to life than that. So, oh, thank yes, you, sir. Right. Uh, most mm -hmm. grateful and... Please stay safe and we will be in touch with you. 
you you're oh, not yes. going to be let off lightly. <laughs> right. uh, I'm looking forward to and great. I'm, I'm grateful that you gave me this no, possibility. We, we, we to are grateful for your doing. time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye, Ralph. Yeah. Bye -bye. Take bye -bye. take care. I'm bye. pretty much honored. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Have a good day then. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye. Gautam, thank you for putting yes, it together. Yeah. Great job. Gautam, thank you for the technical aid and everything. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Welcome, man. Good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Orla, para la fiesta no le iba a estar. No, 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 no.